Good evening. You have just entered the arena where you find John Robson in for Michael Corrin. Next Canada Day, a year from now, Canadians will be gearing up for the 100th anniversary of World War I and our nation's glorious contributions to saving freedom in that dreadful conflict. Or not. It's one of many parts of our history we don't hear much about lest it cause controversy. And if you're wondering why we aren't louder about our love of country, here might be a good place to start. Most of our national story isn't embarrassing, but most of our elite seems to be embarrassed by it. You know, it's true, some of the problem is cultural. We always compare ourselves to the Americans, whose hootin' and holler and July 4th performance has cultural roots dating back over three centuries. It, it, honestly, it's sort of a hillbilly thing. There's nothing wrong with that, but it does rather tend to affect the volume control. You know, even the French are more subdued on Bastille Day, while the English don't celebrate St. George's Day at all, except as a pointed expression of traditionalism, and Great Britain has no national day. You know, down under in Australia, parliamentary insults have an exuberance, things like desiccated coconut, that we can't match. The speaker would object, and the populace would agree. But that doesn't mean Canadians are less vigorous, including in their patriotism. Thus far, it's basically a matter of style, you know, our famously polite tendency to apologize if someone steps on our foot. Regrettably, lately we've been apologizing when someone steps on our history, and that is a problem. Remember Jean Chrétien wishing he'd been able to wake up Montcalm in time to secure a victory for intolerant French absolutism over open British liberty? A churlish dismissal of our entire past, including generous treatment of conquered New France. And Ontario's new premier gave public servants style tips about calling everything Aboriginal territory, as if heroically taming the wilderness to build a free and prosperous nation were essentially an act of patriarchal imperialist bigotry. You know, I'm not denying the dark side of the story. I'm just insisting it's not the main point. You know, the people who built Canada weren't mean. They weren't whiny, they weren't nasty, and they weren't greedy. Of course, some were better than others. Mankind's a mixed bag. But it's not a tale of villainy or some sort of politically correct preparation for our own glorious appearance, and it shouldn't be told that way. I'm not trying to make a partisan issue out of this. When Stephen Harper addressed Britain's Parliament this June, you know, he started well. He invoked our shared constitutional heritage stretching back 800 years, uh, though he couldn't bring himself to say the words Magna Carta, which British Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron recently revealed he didn't understand anyway. But then Harper said that that heritage, quote, allowed us to achieve what others wish for, to choose our governments and hold them accountable, to worship God in our own way and to live in harmony with neighbors who do so differently, and to enjoy standards of living once considered unimaginable while aiding our fellow citizens in their times of illness, unemployment, and need. You know, as, as if the essence of our story were eight or more centuries of multiculturalism in the welfare state. You know, but Canada is not a nation of peacekeepers who in a moment of cultural absent-mindedness stormed Vimy Ridge, nor are we born socialists who accidentally had a smaller government relative to our economy than the Americans until 1958. We come of hardy, free pioneers who can fix their snowmobiles with their chainsaws, who brought King John to heel at Runnymede by the threat of force, and who fought Hitler for God, King, and country. You know, I've had the privilege of being associated with one of Canada's many reserve units, the Brockville Rifles, whose battle honours included Amiens and the Pursuit to Mons. And I can tell you the kind of quiet, unassuming people who won those awards, and who today are going about their business, you know, getting the job done, raising kids, volunteering as firefighters, when necessary, shouldering the soldier's backpack, have written and are still writing a great national story. So why isn't it told? It's as though our betters consider our real heritage shameful and awkward, and like the Narnian tyrant Maraz, are determined to force feed us an invented past that is less true than the wildest fiction, yet duller than the truest history. You know, we're told things like property rights are un-Canadian, as though our homes have not been our castle since Edward Cook was in velvet pants, and as though a defining moment in our history was not Joseph Howe's successful 1835 appeal to a Halifax jury in the name of British liberty and British law to acquit him of libeling arrogant politicians because the things he said about them were true. Will you permit the sacred fire of liberty, he asked the jurors, brought by your fathers from the venerable temples of Britain to be quenched and trodden out on the simple altars your ancestors have raised? Okay, as Canadians, we are unlikely to shout such things from the rooftops. But this Canada Day, how about a quiet dockside toast to the sacred fire of liberty brought from Britain that shone as brightly during the pursuit to Mons as on Juneau Beach and a pledge to keep it burning on our simple altars?
I'm joined now by my colleague Brian Lilly. Uh, we've had a bit of a talk about this before, about these accomplishments in World War I that just are not remembered, as though it were better to forget that our soldiers scared the heck out of the Kaiser's elite. Well, it's one of my uh, kids' favorite stories that the uh, the Canadians were known quite so often as uh, the ladies in skirts because so many of them were in Scottish regiments. So they wore kilts, they were let in by the bagpipes, and that scared them to death. Uh, the, the, kids the ladies just from loved, hell is the phrase. The ladies from hell, yeah. that's right, the ladies from hell. They love that story, and they want to hear it again and again because... Uh, Unlike, uh, I, I guess, most children who will not hear history, we tell them at home because we know it's not going to be taught properly in school. I've been through the history textbooks. I'm a bit of a stickler on that. Some of them are getting better, and that's the good news. But I, I, I want to touch on something you said. You said our elites are embarrassed by our national history. They are, and they're embarrassed by our, our, uh, our liberty that comes with that. This week, we just had Section 13 of the Human Rights Act repealed. And that was the, uh, I'm offended by something you posted on the internet section. It, it essentially quashed free speech. It was repealed through a private member's bill that took six years or more to find someone to have the gumption to put it forward and push to get it through. And it was done not because our elites thought that this was the right thing to do. They just wanted to leave better un uh, alone. It was done because ordinary Canadians said, no, trampling on people's free speech rights is wrong. We shouldn't be allowing it. The people at the top were fine just to leave it as it was. Ordinary Canadians were not. And that ties directly back to the Joseph Howe story because the background is that British libel law, which was brought over to Canada, didn't allow truth as a defense. Howe had said these politicians were crooked, and they were, but they sued him for libel anyway. And he said to the jurors, change the law. You, the law comes ultimately from the people. You are not the sort of people who will be silenced by the king when you say the truth, that he is, has no clothes, that he's a fink, anything you want to say about him, that he's just pawned pawn the crown jewels. And the jurors agreed. And going back, back to, you know, the way common law was created in, in England in the early Middle Ages by the consent of the people to be governed that way, not even by Parliament. This was the people overturning an elite project that they could get away with anything because they put you in jail if you said they were doing it. You know, it, it's, uh, there is a disconnect between the elites at the top and the, the ordinary people. You go across this country, uh, and just as an example, you will see uh, towns with Scottish names straight across the country. And it's not that the Scots are the only hardy people that came here, but the Scots, Ukrainians, Germans, all kinds of them. But I was over at the uh, Museum of Civilization recently. This is our big national museum to tell our national story. And if you did not, if you just went based on what was that, you were a tourist to Canada, you would think that Canada was a French country that uh, had some Indians in it, and the Vikings had visited years ago, and then suddenly there was multiculturalism. There is no telling of the story of how, uh, after the conquest of New France, that a, a, a mainly Scottish uh, merchant class came in, that they developed the Hudson's Bay Company primarily, and then they developed the Hudson's Bay primary uh, competitor, the Northwest Company, that there were battles straight across the country, uh, that all of this was going on. You would think that Canada was primarily a French country. That's not the way our story actually unfolds. So it's being fixed, but the elites are all howling that it is being fixed and might actually show the true nature of this country. Yeah, and speaking of Quebec, where oddly people do tell pollsters they're Catholic and they celebrate Saint Jean Baptiste Day, you know, there's everything is Saint this and Saint that, and yet, you know, they would flee from their heritage if they knew where it was buried. You don't want to go and tell them this is a, a province that was founded by Catholics who were proud of their religious faith, thought it was what made them different, who adhered to the teachings of the church, at least theoretically, more fiercely, it seems, than the church itself did. So the, the Quebecers have ditched their heritage in the name of not agreeing with whatever ours might be if someone knew what that was. Everybody at the top seems to be burying it. They call it the Grand Noirceur, the Great Darkness, when they were these people who tamed a, con a large part of a continent against appalling odds, develop, you know, their own breeds of cattle, their own horses, this extraordinary adaptability that you'd think we'd be celebrating. Just know that anything that you've probably been told about Canadian history, other than from yourself, over the last 40 years is probably wrong. Uh, look, this whole thing that I know you'll be talking about on the show today about the seizing of guns in, in Alberta. So I was writing about that this morning, uh, sending out Facebook posts, uh, blog posts, everything. And I had people coming back to me and saying, well, we don't have a, a gun culture in Canada anyway, and we don't have gun rights, and, and this is just an American thing. No, it's not. It, that's like, uh, you know, the, the whole free speech thing earlier. The, the free speech or the human rights commissar is saying 
free speech was an American concept. It's not. It never was. Well, they're doing the same thing here. The National Rifle Association, when it started, came to Canada to learn how to teach people to be marksmen. They came to Canada for advice on how to do things, because we used to be as free as the Americans. That's our true history, and the people that settled the West, that moved across this country from the small towns that started by the United Empire loyalists in places like Ontario, and then people said, well, you know, this is nice, but it's a little boring, and I hear there's free land. They carried rifles with them. They carried pistols with them. They went West armed to the teeth because they didn't know what they were going to be facing. That's part of Canada's heritage. It wasn't peaceful just because the Mounties were there. That's, that's a his, uh, history moment type thing that's false. It was peaceful because the people didn't uh, believe in the rule of law. They, we were just as armed as the wild, wild west. Yeah, and not just they believed in the rule of law, but also they were competent. They were not afraid of the guns they carried. They knew how to use them. And it's curious, I was reading a British mystery novel from uh, 1937 where a murder is committed in a theater. And the author comments, if you go down to the end of your garden for some target practice with your revolver, the neighbors are probably just going to say that you're potting about unless they're exceptionally sensitive. Uh, you know, in Britain, too, it's perfectly commonplace for people to own firearms. We got that from Britain. Our British heritage includes armed self-defense, including of our liberties. And suddenly, it's, it's all become so hushed up. I was actually told a story by a commanding officer of a, a Canadian regiment that went down to reenact an American defeat in the War of 1812. And the Americans happily had this thing go through the streets of their town. I mean, the Americans seemed more enthusiastic about a battle they lost in the war than the Canadians, <laughs> other than the people directly involved. But, you know, our reenactments here were sort of tepid. The Americans were like, sure, remember how you, you beat us. It'll be colorful. It'll be great. Bring cannons. Uh, there's just kind of this feeling there's something wrong with us having been independent and vigorous people. Like, for instance, it would make us less dependent on government. The, oh, this is true. And, and the idea, and I like that you pointed out in the monologue that Canada had a smaller government prior to 1958 than the Americans. We also used to be a more religious people than the Americans. I remember uh, someone sending me a Toronto Star article sniffing at how the Americans so irreligious compared to us. Well, there you go. <laughs> the real Canada, just in time for Canada Day. Thanks very much. Thank you.